it's flashing. It's working, cool. So hi, welcome. Um, my name is Simon. This session is called QA, will it break? Um, I have this favorite YouTube show, who's which is called uh, Will It Blend? Uh, where this crazy scientist guy puts stuffs in a blender and it uh, blends, basically. Uh, so based on that, I thought it would be a funny title to do quality assurance, will it break, instead of will, blur, will blend. Uh, and this is my take on uh, PowerShell testing and testing in PowerShell in general. So for the agenda, first of all, uh, I'm going to talk a bit about um, why we should be testing, what benefits there are to use Pest uh, Pester as a testing framework. Um, and we're going to talk about a little bit different types of, te of testing. Then we're going to talk about Pester basics. So the syntax in Pester, uh, how we use it, and um, some of its features. Uh, and then we're going to go to a demo. I'm going to show a few extremely simple tests. I have a function just returning a string. I'm going to test that it returns the string I actually um, expected to, to return. And then we go from there to a little bit more advanced examples uh, and so on. So usually when I get home from conferences like this, I realize that I would like to sit down and rewrite probably half, or at least half of my code. Um, and that's a lot of work. And to be honest, I've never done it, but I would really like to. Um, and one of the reasons that it's really cumbersome to refactor something or rewrite something is because it's really hard to determine if it will work as it did before once I fixed it. And also, a lot of times I've been um, asked to, to implement a new feature or uh, to improve something in a, in a script already running in production. So sometimes I get a script that I've written six months ago, one year ago, two years ago. Uh, and sometimes I get a script that someone else written. And sometimes they s claim that I wrote it, but I don't know it wasn't me. Um, and a lot of the times, this is kind of how you look when, when you get like, what the heck was whoever wrote this thinking about? Um, so when you get this feeling of like, all right, I have something here. I think it does something, but I'm not really sure what it does. And I really don't know why it looks like this. So the probabilities are that it looks like that because of a reason. And that reason is almost never sufficiently documented. So if I'm able to write documentation that tells me this function, or this script, or this piece of code acts in this way. And if I give it this input, this is the output I expect to, to receive, given a certain environment, a certain scenario. Um, if I can document and write all that, I also have that documentation being executable, so I can run the documentation and actually verify that it is correct. Then I can run those tests and verify that if I give my, my code a certain input in a certain environment, I will get this exact output. Um, and then I can feel more confident in introducing change refactoring and changing how the code look inside this function, because I can verify that as long as I give it the right input, the right output in the static environment or in, in the same environment, it works as it did before. And this also helps me, helps me to, to verify that I didn't break any previous functionality when I introduced new functionality. So the first type of testing that I started using uh, in PowerShell is using test for quality assurance. And that's just that. When I edit something that I've written previously or someone else might have written previously, First of all, I don't want to introduce 
new bugs. I don't want to break things that worked before. So if I have a function doing a certain thing, and the customer asks me to, to say, oh, well, doing this thing, it works great. But now we also need to do that thing. So I implement that thing, and by accident, I break the first thing. Or maybe they use it in some kind of obscure way that I didn't think about when I did the edit, but I thought about it when I did the, the initial implementation. And maybe I broke that certain functionality. So using uh, tests for quality assurance uh, is about testing exactly a function. You say, this is the input, and this is the environment, and this is the output I want to get from it. So, and that is basically called unit testing. <coughs> and this also helps me to not to repeat errors and mistakes. Because sometimes I write something and I realize, like in this certain scenario, it doesn't work because of this thing. Then I can write a test that covers that certain scenario. And as long as I have that test, I can make sure that I won't repeat that mistake again. I won't like, reintroduce that bug. And also, even if I was really hes hesitant about it in the beginning, I realized that it saves a lot of time. So first time I wrote the test for a script, it took me quite some time to wrap my head around how to test it and how to work out the testing syntax and all that. But once I got used to it, I realized that if I spend just a little time in the beginning writing, this is how I want my code to perform, or this is what I wanted to do, uh, and then I implement it. And if I want to do a change later on, I don't have to go back and spend hours trying to figure out how is this working, what did I think about when I implemented it, and in which ways is it used. So that way I can easily like document all the scenarios that I use it for and verify that it works. And since this documentation or test is executable, I can execute it and actually make sure that it works. So next type of testing, um, well, next type of tests I started using was uh, to use tests to define requirements. So I re realized that I could write functions and then I can write tests that verify that the functions worked the way I intended them to do when I created them. And once I modify them, I can verify that they still worked the way I intended them to do. So then I started reading up about this test-driven development or behavior-driven de development, uh, which is kind of the next level, I guess. Um, and this makes it possible for me to write a specification saying, I want a function that giving this input in this environment gives, gives me exactly this output. Uh, and when I can do that, I can give this specification to basically anyone and say, write code, and once you fulfill this specification, you have fulfilled my requirements. So now I could start collaborating with my colleagues in a whole new way, because before I did like this large projects all by myself, and I wrote a lot of code, uh, and I had to do like everything by myself, because every time I tried to say, hey, can you help me like just do this small little part? There was al always a lot of time spent about like misunderstandings, and they say, oh, like, sure, no problem, I'll get back to you in two days, and you'll have this code. And two days later, they come back with, with something, and then I go, like, that's not at all what I wanted. I wanted it to look like this. And then we had a lot of discussions, and then we had to do, like, reiterate and do the same thing again. Um, it might be me that's just really bad to explaining for people what I want them to perform, but once I realized that I can write a test, and once they can run the test against their code and all the tests turn green, then I'm happy because they fulfill my requirements. It's a very unambiguous specification. It, it tests correctly or it fails. So that way, I can start writing tests saying, I want this functionality, I want this functionality, and I want this functionality. And I can give each specification to a different colleague or developer or whatever. And as soon as they can fulfill the tests, they, they have the correct code. And if the code they bring me isn't working, it's because I wrote 
the wrong tests. So I can make sure that they are delivering to me what I asked for. And this makes it possible for me to, to divide large problem into small units and, and give each unit to a different person and later on I can put it together. So, and then we have the third type of test I've been looking a little bit at, and that's for testing actual functionality. So, when I run unit tests, I just want to test the logic of my code. I want to make sure that this code uh, acts in a certain way. But once I'm done with it, I want to like run it in a real environment somewhere. Um, real environment, not production environment. Um, and make sure that it actually does what I think it does. So that's integration testing. And a few examples of that could be like hitting a web server, seeing if you get the expected web page back, or uh, like testing a configuration, make sure that these, these, this, this, this service is actually running, or run this command and make sure that this file exists on disks, disk and contains this code and such. And as stated previously, uh, Irvin at PSH Irvin uh, had, has a blog where he wrote a cool example of how he ex um, extracts information from AD like on a regular basis. And then he can take the, the, the information he extracted last time and compare it to the information he extracted this time and he can test that his configuration is consistent. So he can extract information about domain controllers, global catalog servers, um, Tismo road holders, domain names, sites configuration, and all of that, that information and then he can compare that to, to the current state and that way he can monitor when something changes, which is really cool. So when we test using PowerShell, um, I use a framework. Most people use a framework called Pester. Uh, it's written as an open source project. It was adopted by Microsoft and VMware approximately a year ago, I think. Um, and it has really grown since. So when we write the Pester test, a Pester test is basically just a PowerShell script. So it's a PowerShell script that does three things. The first thing it does is it makes sure that the function or the code that I want to test is available. So I need to load functions. I need to like dot source scripts that contains functions. I need to load mem uh, modules. I just need to make sure that whatever I, I want to test is made ava available in my current scope. The second thing I do is to use describe and context to group my texts. So Pester requires me to use uh, something called a describe block. And a describe block is like the largest container for tests. And within that describe block, I can put my tests. And if I want to, I can divide them into smaller sections. And these sections uh, uses the keyword or the command or whatever you want to call it, uh, context. So I need to have one, at least one describe block. And within that describe block, I can have zero or more uh, context block. And both the describe block and the context block, block are um, scopes for a bunch of things that we'll look at uh, in a while. And once I have these describe blocks and maybe I have a few context um, blocks, I put it, it blocks within within these, and an it block is like one test. So every time I want to test something, I write it and a description of what I think or want it to do, followed by a script block. And if this script block at any time returns uh, an exception or throws an exception, um, then the test will fail. And Within the, the script block, I use uh, a specific command called should, which is part of the Pester uh, framework. So if I pipe something to should, and then I have uh, a bunch of 
not sure what the, the word type is, but comparison uh, operators, basically. So it could be B and uh, a bunch of other uh, operators. And then the, the value that I want to be. So in this, in this case, I run my command invoke task, I pipe the result to should, and I assert that it should be my expected value. So to get back to the syntax, the first thing we do is to write the describe block. Uh, the describe block has a description. So it has a name or, or description. Um, you can give it whatever name or description you want to. Um, make sure it describes what it is you're testing, because it makes it a lot easier when you read the output. Um, and if you want to, you can give it tags. So I can do tags and say this is a unit test. That, that should be a character just like this one. It's just a, the font makes it a little bit weird. Um, so I can say this test is, uh, or this block is for unit testing. This is for functional testing. And then when, when I invoke my test, I can say I only want to invoke those with this tag. Um, I can also call, yeah, tags are like free text, so I can call them whatever I want to. But using tags should be uh, is a, is a great way to, to say I only want to run these set of tests. Within the describe block, I can create a context block. And the context block uh, looks pretty similar to the describe block. It is not the mandatory block, but it scopes things. So if I define um, a few things in here, it will be scoped to the context block. And it won't affect anything outside of its scope. Um, and I use context block in, for two reasons. First, if I want to create a scope, uh, to scope something within it, and we're going to look about what we can scope. Um, and for a second reason is when I want to group my tests, because when I run the test, it will say this is the description or the describe block, and then it will do like subcategories for uh, context. So um, I can say describe this commandlet, and the context could be running with input from pipeline or and running without input from pipeline, for instance. So within that context block, I create an it block. So in this case, I say it does something. And does something is what my test will be named. So name it like creates a file or does this. Um, and if I want to, I can also use the parameter pending on a test. And that is really useful, because if I add the pending parameter to an it block, it will tell Pester that this test isn't complete yet, so don't run it. It is basically the same thing as commenting an it block out. But if I comment it out, it won't be in my output at all. If I mark it as pending, it will just be skipped, and that I will see in my output that I skipped that test. So this way I can yeah, basically try out tests without running all, all of them and so on. And last but not least, I do my actual test. I run some code, and I pipe the result to should be something, in this case, the, the value of the dollar thing. And within the it block, it's, and within all of these, it's important to remember that this is just PowerShell. It is like, it's not something magical. I can. I can write whatever PowerShell code I want within my, git, uh, within my it statement here. So it's just a script block that's being executed. And I could go do whatever I want. I can do a lot of um, lines of code and create a variable and pipe that variable to should be something. I can have several shoulds. And if one of them fails, the test will fail. So there is no limitation. Like you can only have one should. You can only have one line. It's just think of this part as it's a script block, it's PowerShell, and you don't even need to use should. Uh, you can just return stuff yourself, and as long as it doesn't throw, and I think it has to return true, um, but we'll test it later on. So you could basically uh, implement the whole script block by yourself and just return something. Uh, but using should makes it really easy to read, 
uh, it makes it consistent, and it makes it easier to to write because they they look all the same. So I said that we could could use should be. We can also use a bunch of other uh, operators. We could use should be greater than, should be less than, should be null or empty, um, should contain. Should contain is a bit weird actually because it it accepts a string, and if that string uh, is a path to a file, it will open the file and make sure that it, that file contains the text that you want it to contain. And if you give it a string that isn't a file a path to a file, it will just throw and say file doesn't exist. Uh, so that is way f far from from what I expected it to to do. I thought that I could like give it an array and say if the array of numbers one, two, three, four, five contains three, then we're good. Uh, if you try that, it'll say the file one doesn't exist and then throw. Um, containing exactly works the same way, but it's case sensitive. Um, contain is also kind of cool in a way that you c it can accept one, more than one string and it will make sure that all of the files contains the same thing. Sh yes? Should it contain the whole content of the file or should the file contain a line that matches the input? Well, actually, it doesn't. It will compare the whole file to your string, and if your string is contained within the file, it will return true. It doesn't need to match a whole line. So you can say, like, contains, I don't know, string sandwich. And if you have the word sandwich in your file, it'll pass the test. Um, and then we have uh, exist match 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 exactly and throw throw is also a bit specific uh, special because when you use throw you need to put the the code you execute within a script block and pipe the script block to throw uh, should throw uh, otherwise it will throw uh, <laughs> so so that's kind of weird but once you get used to it it works. So next thing I want to look about look at, and it's quite a lot of PowerPoint slides here, but I feel that it's it's easier to to show these kind of code parts uh, in slides than just typing them. So it it gets uh, a little bit messy when you put them all in in one screen, uh, especially on on a rather small screen. So a mock uh, is something we do to replace a command. So if I mock something, I will make sure that my implementation of that command is run, ran in, uh, instead of the actual command. And this was really hard to, to understand for me when I started trying to write these tests, because if I replace a command, then I'm not testing my code, right? I'm replacing it with something else, and that's that's kind of weird. So. What I realized is if I create a function and I want that function, for instance, to um, get users from uh, Active Directory, I don't need to test the functionality of get ad user. I'm going to assume that get ad user, given the correct set of parameters in the correct environment, will return a certain thing. So if I mock get ad user, then I don't actually even need an AD. I will say whenever a get AD user is called, it should return this thing. And I will just return a custom object saying, this is the distinguished name, this is the same account name, this is the whatever. And that way I can make sure that I get the same result every time. And I do not need to set up a new AD and create a user in a certain place with a certain parameters to make it work as I expected it. So this way I can get static results, so I know I can get the same result every time. And I also don't need some external system to actually query. I can just fake that I'm querying Active Directory and say, if I query Active Directory and I use the identity parameter and it has this value, and I also use this parameter and that parameter has this value, then this is the result I'm going to return, or it will return. So this way I can test my code and just assume that the commands that my code use will work. 
And if get AD user doesn't work, I don't really think it's my responsibility to test that. My responsibility to test that. So I, I have to assume that that works. Uh, so mock in its simplest form looks like this. I just write mock. I write the command name that I want to replace with my mock, and I give it a script block. So every time my code calls get content, no matter which parameters I use, it'll return the string file content. So this way, I don't need to have a file somewhere that I will actually call. And this way, I can run this script on any computer. And no matter which file I try to open, it, that file will always seem to contain one line that is file content. Um, if I want to be a little bit more advanced, I can add a parameter called parameter filter. And a parameter filter uh, works basically like the filter script parameter on where object. So it will just compare parameters. And it will. you can access all the parameters by using dollar parameter name, just like you would within, inside a function. So in this case, this mock will only return file content if the file, uh, if the path parameter has the value c colon backslash logs backslash log dot log. So only in this case, I will return file content. In any other, in any other case, I will actually run get content. So in this way, I can fake different results depending on which file I query. So I can say, if you query this file, this is the result you're going to get. If you query that file, this is, the, this is another result that you're going to get. And I can also uh, use a parameter called verifiable. So if I mark a mock as verifiable, um, I can later on, within a test, um, run a command that will verify that all my verifiable mocks were invoked. So all the mocks that I want to make sure that this mock should be used, it should be called from my code. Then I just mark it as verifiable. And then I can easily say, with one command, make sure all my verifiable mocks were actually used. Because if they weren't, something went wrong. So I'm going to fail the test. Yes? Can you check that they have been called with the right parameters? Uh, well, this mock is not the same mock as a mock with another parameter filter. So if I make them all verifiable, I can make sh sure that they all have been run at least once. Yeah. Sorry, the question was if I can make sure that different uh, that they have been run with uh, different parameter filters. Um, and if this command is run from within a module, then I can mock my command in the scope of that module. So if I have a function in a module that calls something and I want to mock that something, uh, then it won't help if I define my mock in my current scope. I have to define it within my module scope. Otherwise, I won't be able to access it, right? So then I can add dash module name my module, and that will like inject the mock inside a module scope. So that's mocks. Uh, there are also a few other constructs that we use uh, in Pester. So it's an alternative to using the in module is to using an in module scope block. So everything I uh, put within a module scope block will be injected to the module. And the syntax for in module scope is basically in module scope, name of the module followed by a script uh, block. Um, I can also I also get something called test drive. So every time I invoke a context block or a describe block, that block has its own um, test drive. So a test drive is basically a temporary folder created in your temporary in your temp folder, and that folder will be created when we start a describe block and when we start the context block. And within that context block, you can access that um, folder, because it's going to be mounted as a PS drive, and the name of that PS drive will be test drive. So instead of saying, create a temp folder in and $env-temp uh, and put stuff in it, and once I'm done, remove the folder, Pesto does that for us automatically. And we can access that folder by using the, um, the PS drive test drive colon, 
and we can also get the path of that folder in an automatic variable created that's called $test drive, and it will contain the full path to the temporary folder. I can also do uh, before all, after all, before each, and after each. So if I want to set up something and say, within this context block, before every it statement, I want to run this certain code to kind of prep my environment or reset something or do something. I can just give it a before all the, um, block and say, this is my before all block. And if I define that before all block in the uh, context scope, everything in that context scope will execute the before all block before it executes itself or uh, before it runs. And the same with after all and uh, sorry, before each and after each will do it uh, before everyone and after everyone and before all and after all will will run once before everything and once after everything. Uh, and if I define this before all in my describe block and have a bunch of context block, then it will run before all context block within that describe block. So basically before each construct or before all constructs in my current scope. All right, so that's the slides. Let's see how this actually looks. So for starters, I have defined a really simple function. So this function has one parameter, it takes path, and it gets the content of that path. So I create a describe block saying, this test is called demo test. Within that describe block, I have defined a context block saying, I'm, this context is my mock demo. So it's basically a, a container within the describe block. Then within this context, I mock get content. So I say, every time get content is called, I will write output this string. So this is what I will fake the, the, input, uh, the content of the file. And, but only if the, if the parameter path is equal to this path. And I make this mock verifiable. And then I run my tests, or I define my tests first. So I say, it returns content of file. So I run my uh, function, which I defined up here. Test one, I give it a path, which is this static path. And since this is the path that I'm mocking, it should return file content. So this actually tests that my function calls get content with path, which is kind of obvious. Um, but I just want to make a really simple example. So once I've verified that, I'm going to verify that my get content mock was actually called once. So I can do that by using the command assert mock called. So I said mod called is part of the Pesto framework too, or the Pesto module. And it takes the name of the mock and uh, how many times, and I think I can also, also give it a parameter filter. Uh, so I can say the mock of get content with this parameter filter should have been called this many times. The mock of get content with that parameter file filter should be called that many times. Um, and if I use the parameter exactly, it should have been called exactly one time. If I don't use exactly, it should have been called at least one time. Um, and I can also, in the end here, ref um, verify that all my verifiable mocks were run. And since this mock is verifiable, this will pass the test. And as I said, this is just partial, so I is going to hit F5 to run the tests. There we go. Uh, so the output of this is a bunch of write host strings. Yes? Um, since those assert mock uh, commands are built into the tester module, you don't have to use the should statement? Exactly. So um, not sure if this runs outside. No, no they don't. Um, so I don't need to, I, I, don't, I don't need to have a should um, statement within a test block. Uh, I just need to assert something. Um, 
So if I just run a search verifiable mock uh, that asserts that that uh, the mocks were run and then it will pass the test for me. Uh, and if I want to break a test, I could say throw, and that will fail the test. Um, because with a message saying script halted. Uh, so I could write all my tests saying like, if something whatever equals dollar, should be typing, uh, dollar A, then throw not as six, Expected, or maybe I should say not equals like this. So if I run this, uh, it'll fail the test and say not as expected. So the should just makes that prettier for me. I don't need to use should. I can just write a bunch of code, and if the test doesn't pass, it throws something, and the something will be my error message in my uh, log. Um, but writing a bunch of code is a lot, like reading a bunch of code in a test takes a lot more time than just reading, all right, so this is what we're doing and this is what it should be. Richard? If I'm understanding correctly, if you use should and the test fails, it'll just keep going on to the other test. Whereas if you use throw, you're going to terminate everything? Um, let's try that. I don't think you'll terminate it, but so no, it will still run. It says it runs the rest of the test. Okay. No, yeah, yeah it's it's, yeah. it's continuous, but uh, these tests depend on this one. So since I fail this one, these fails too. Um, if I keep this run running and I'm just inserting a throw in here. This one, yeah, this one throws in. Yeah, so throwing something is just like, it's just failing that test and it keeps on going. Um, now we're done with that one, so I'm part of resetting it. And a little bit more advanced. I do the exact same thing, but instead of writing a function within my test, which is kind of cumbersome when I have a bunch of functions, um, I do a remove module to make sure that I don't have this module imported. Um, I could as well done get module pipe uh, remove module, and then I don't need the error action so I don't continue. Um, and then I import the module. Uh, in this case, I point at a certain uh, folder for my module. So I say the folder my module and my p script root. Uh, that's what I want to import, and I use dash force to to over or reload it if it were already loaded. It shouldn't be loaded because I just removed it, but you can never be too sure, right? Uh, and I use error action stop just to make sure that this will throw if it, fa if it fails to import my module, because then it's no point of running my tests, right? Um, then I have a describe block saying, this is my test, I call it demo test. And if we go back to the output and scroll up to the successful test up here, you'll see, Oh, well, and so we see describing and demo test context mock demo. So this is the how we get the output. So I have two contexts in this case. The first context I called mock demo, and my second context I called in module scope. Uh, in my first mock demo um, context, I declare a mock saying get content, just like I did before. Um, and then I have the same um, mocks. But in this case, I use module name my module to insert the mock within the module scope. So now, whenever get content is called from within my module scope, I mock it if it's called with the uh, correct parameters. If it's called from outside my module scope, I won't mo mock it. And in module scope, can be in many different contexts, like in describe or in context 
Yeah, so um, the the scope of the mock is the context, if it's in a context. And if it's outside of a, co the co a context, the scope is describe. So both describe and context s creates the scope for mocks. Um, I can declare my mock within an if statement. So I can move my mock down here. Um, but the it statement won't contain my mock. It's not a scope for mocks. So it will be defined in all my it statements within that context, uh, which is a bit tricky, and you have to get used to that one. But uh, and the the um, it will be injected into the scope of the module I've named, as long as we're in that context. So now I'm calling test2, which is uh, an, a function equal to test1. But this function is defined within my module. And I have my module here. So my module contains two functions. It contains a test2, uh, which does basically the same thing as the first one, except it also does a write p verbose. And write p verbose is a function here that does a write, write verbose. So these functions aren't really useful in real-world scenarios, but I want to make them really short so I can fit them on one screen. Um, and then I export module member, and I only export test2. So write p verbose is a private function to the module, and I can't call it from outside the module. If you go back to my tests, um, I make sure that it returns file content, yes, as before. Uh, the only difference here is that it is now called from within the module. And I assert the same thing, and I use exactly one times, just like before. Now I've added that it should be asserted within the module name. Since the mock is within the module, I need to assert that the mock within the module is, is called. And then I'll just assert that all verifiable mocks were on. And I don't need to do this in some kind of scope. It's just going to assert all my modules defined in, in the current scope. Is this uh, runs all verifiable mock something you can put in a before or, or after all, after each statement? I would assume. So we could. Uh, yeah, sure. So so we could do like uh, it run. Whoa. Runs all verifiable mocks. Mocks. Like this. Uh, oh. So after each. You mean like this? Yeah, that was my thinking. Yeah. So For all contexts, then yes. yeah, let's try it. I, I assume it works. Uh, I, I guess you shouldn't have an if block in the after each. But then it's maybe not. So it doesn't. Then it doesn't give you any output, maybe. No. Um. No worries. I've never thought of using it that way, but uh, usually the after each and uh, before each is used to like prepare the environment or set up something or create a file somewhere. Not for, not for running for tests, no. Um, all right, and the next example here is another context. And instead of using the dash module name, my module everywhere, I create an in module scope uh, script block or an in module scope block. And I say, everything within here should be ran inside of the module scope of my module. And this, and then I mock the right verbose. And here, again, I don't need to add the module name because I'm already in the module scope. And I'm going to verify or um, that if I call write p verbose with a message of my path, then it should return my path. And what I'm doing is that I mock the right verbose and say every time you get mock for uh, you we call right verbose, we'll just out write output the message, and this is just a 
simple trick to advert the, the uh, verbose messages to, to the output stream. Um, Yeah, because pverbose is my private function. Uh, so this is the function I'm testing, and I'm testing that this function actually calls write verbose with, with the correct message in the module scope. All right, so that's the examples. Uh, now I've actually written a few tests. So I took one of the tests that, that I've written. Uh, I've created a module uh, containing a DC resource for adding um, sites to trusted sites and restricted sites and so on. So the DC resource is called Simon W underscore zone site. Um, and that is actually a, a DC resource is defined as a module within a module. So I need to load it as a module to be able to test it. Um, so the first thing I do on the first line here is just to figure out where my module is. Um, so I say in the current directory, and you go up one directory, then you go into the DC resources directory, and in that you go into the zone site directory, and there is a PSM1 file, just load that, please. So I do a remove module, and then I import the module. So this just loads the functions within there for me. Um, and then I say, within this module scope, so everything I want to test, I want to do test within the scope of the module. And then I've created six contexts. So when I add things to trusted sites, uh, I do that by adding reg register keys to the current user hive. And those register keys behaves a bit different or like a bit weird. I kind of backwards engineering by listening to what happened in the registry when I add the things in, in Internet Explorer. So if I give it a, um, a URL, uh, it kind of parses down to the only the domain of the URL. And then it, if that contains more than two strings, so if it's something.com, it will just keep it as something.com. But if it's like, blog.something.com, it will split it and create one key that is something.com and a sub key below that that is the, the site or whatever, the subdomain. And even if, this, if there are like 10 subdomains, a.very.long.domain.name.something.com will be split up into two strings, something.com and all the rest. Um, so I had to create a few private functions within my module. Uh, and the first of them is get zone site name. So this is just a small function that uses regular expressions to parse out the part of the URL that I want. So I'm testing this. So if I give it a URL that is http colon slash slash site dot domain dot top dash slash something slash page dot htm, it should just return the string site dot top dot site dot domain dot top. So it kind of it takes this whole thing and it figures out this is the part I want and that it returns that one. So I'm just verifying that my regu regular expression actually works. Um, and this is like a thing with Pester because because when I started doing this, I put all my like regex and stuff within my function, um, but that makes it really hard to test it. And a fairly complex regular expression, you probably want to be able to test that that works as expected uh, because of two reasons. First reason, it's really simple to do a type in a regexp and then it won't work, or like to have bad luck when you're thinking uh, and like make a regexp that actually doesn't work. And for that reason, not everyone is equally good at reading regexp as you are. Uh, and not everyone thinks about the regex exactly like you do. So someone might go, why did he do like that? that? And if you have a bunch of examples saying, if I give it this, it returns that. If I give it this, it returns that. Uh, then it's easy for them to see, ah, so this is what the, what the regex does. And they don't have to actually read the regex. They can just verify how it works. So I, I throw a bunch of different URLs, an FTP URL, 
uh, just a uh, FQD in server, uh, a uh, FQD and UNC path, a NetBIOS UNC path, and an invalid URI. And this is the part I said that throw is a bit tricky because you have to put the code that should throw within a script block. Uh, otherwise, it will throw inside the it, and that will fail the test. Right? Um, so for my next context, I used something which is an extremely cool feature for it blocks. So within an it block, instead of like defining a bunch of it blocks that does basically the same thing, I can use something called a test case. And a test case is, a, is an array of hash tables. So I create my, uh, my array of hash tables called test cases and I just give it a bunch of hash tables, and then I refer to that uh, array with a test cases parameter at my it block. And if I do that, the it block will automatically run one time for each hash table in my array, and every time it runs, it will splat the hash table to the uh, script block, which is like magically when you realize how it works. So. And I can also access the uh, keys, or actually the value of the keys in my hash table by using this special syntax in my uh, name. So now I can say it, recur it returns the correct value for type, which will be replaced by whatever value type has in my hash table. And then I can say my script block takes two parameters it takes a URI and an expected value. And since I splat URI type and expected to the script block, it'll pick up the, those as name parameters. And the type will just go to the like, remaining arguments. Um, and then I can just call get some site name dash URI should be expected. So if I call it with this URI, I should get this value. And if I call it with this URI, I should get this value, and so on. So if I ever want to redefine this test, I only need to do it once, because I have like an automatic, automatic loop in here. And if I need to add more test cases, I can do that. And if I want to define my test cases in a JSON, I can do that and just import it. So this makes it like extremely more dynamic. Um, and at the end, I just make sure it throws if it's given a, an invalid URI. So this is the same test as before. It's just a different approach to it. Um, so the first two context blocks test the same thing, but this way is just easier to handle once you want to make different tests. I also have a private function called get path. Uh, this is the one that splits the name in, in the uh, URI, so if I get the uh, a domain name like is that, that is this, it should return it like this, because it will create a key called name of top in that we we'll call a sub key like that. Um, and I have a, a get item property path that just gets the uh, the reg key, the f and I can specify if I want it for uh, the 32-bit part of the uh, registry, the 64-bit path of the registry, or both by defining all. Uh, so that's just, I broke that out to a different function. Uh, and then the last test I want to do in the beginning, I said, this is just PowerShell. And this is just PowerShell, so you can just write any type of PowerShell script you want in here. So what I've done here is that I start by defining some configuration, saying my type is FTP, my zone is restricted, and the URIs are the following. So I have, I have a hash table with two URIs, one URI that, that uh, is existing in that zone. So in my test case here, I prepare a scenario where the URI is, or the domain is added as uh, a restricted site for the protocol FTP. And then I have another URI that is uh, non-existing, so that doesn't exist. And then I create a mock here saying, whenever you call get item property, so whenever you call you get an item property from the registry, um, mock it with nothing, so we don't return anything, which is exactly what would happen if you try to 
uh, get an item property that doesn't exist. So here I tell my tests that no register property exists whatsoever. And then I say, but if you call it with these filters, like if you're using the existing domain, then we should return that there is a register entry called FTP with the value of four, which is four means restricted sites. So this way I can make sure that I mock that the only thing that is entered into any zone in Internet Explorer is appearing to be that site for the FTP protocol in restricted sites and nothing else. So I never have to touch the actual sites. And then what I do is just doing a for each and a for each and a for each. So I say for each platform that I want to test this, uh, for the 32-bit hive, for the 64-bit hive, and for both of them, um, test each of these URIs. And for each of these URIs, make sure that the correct one is present and the correct one is absent. So test both defining them as absent and as present. So then within here, I have one test saying, run all these things. Uh, and in my describe, I just put in uh, the, the insure. So I, I injected the, uh, the values I use in my current loop just to keep track of them. It'll make more sense once we run it. And then I'm going to run my test target resource and I'm going to use the selected URI, and I'm going to ensure that it's both present and absent, uh, and I'm going to use the type FTP, and I'm going to use the zone, both the present zone and the non-present zone, and I'm going to use this with both the 64-bit, 32-bit, and both of them. And I am using just a sub uh, expression to calculate what it should return. So this way, I can make 12 tests in one test. So I will run it and say, if I say that the existing key should be present, it should return present, or it should be true. If I say, ensure that the uh, existing key is absent, it should return false. So these are all the 12 outcomes that I can have from my test target resource. And we have three minutes left, so we're just in time to run this test. And as you see, I get a lot more tests than I've actually defined. So first I get my, uh, the test I defined uh, for my first private function. Then I get the same test with one difference that I have uh, slightly different uh, messages. But you can see that I inject the protocol from, um, from my test cases. Then I'm just doing the, the other two uh, private properties. And here you can see that my nested loops runs 12 tests in 12 different scenarios. And you'll see that it returns false if the reg entry doesn't exist in the 32-bit registry hive when ensure is equal to present. So this way, I can just run all of them. And this test is basically true for with a little bit of tweaking for every test target resource there is in all the DSC resources. So I can just copy paste these loops and just replace my, my values and I can use it to test like all scenarios or all outcomes of test target resource. <coughs> so I know I'm handing questions. Cool, thank you. <laughs> yes? Uh, can you negate the uh, should members? So yes, you can negate everything. You, should, uh, you can negate them all with not. Um, good. You had a question? Um, if I have a test which is small or less dependent on another test, like the first three you wrote, mm -hmm. can I just skip the dependent test? Because if I have a uh, well, not called function and I know it because the test failed, for example, could just skip the other test because I do not gain any information from that. That's a good question. I don't know. I think you can put the asserts in the same it. Yeah, sure. You can you can uh, you can do both should and assert and assert, uh, and that way you can write it in one test. Be the same for every yeah, okay. absolutely. 
So every, and you can put a lot of shoulds in one it, and as long as they all pass, it will pass. So as a summary, try to divide code in small testable functions. It makes your life a lot easier. Um, when I started writing tests, I thought, how the can I write tests for everything for all my scripts? It's going to take a whole lifetime. And yeah, sure, it does. But start small. Test something. Because if you test for 10 scenarios, then you make sure that those 10 scenarios will work. And every time you write a new test, you will make sure that the new scenario will work in the future. And then there is something called continuous integration, which could be a whole new session. Uh, and once I have a lot of tests, uh, on GitHub I use something called AppFair. So every time I check in code to GitHub, AppFair kicks off a process where it downloads my whole repository, spins up a new VM in Azure, injects the code, and runs all the tests with one command called invoke pester, which will search for PS1 files named .tests.ps1 and just execute them. And if every test uh, passes, and if I am in a release branch or in something else, whatever I want to uh, verify, then it will create a package for me and publish that package to the PS module gallery. So testing makes everything a lot easier, and I can continuously deploy stuff for to the gallery or to web server when I want, uh, as soon as I'm sure that all my test passes. All right, so that was all I had. <laughs>